teachers and um, non-math teachers, not that anyone is not a uh, math teacher in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but let's start off before we actually get into the nitty gritty. Um, I'd like if you could uh, take a look at these four shapes up here on the, uh, on the projector. And in your head, I, just, without saying anything, just mentally in your head, I want you to pick the shape that doesn't belong. So in your head, don't, don't tell your neighbor just yet, pick the shape that doesn't belong. And just think about that for about 15, 20 seconds. Okay, now I'd like you to turn to your elbow partner, that's the person sitting next to you, um, and tell them which one you think doesn't belong and why. And then I want you to invite their response as well. So whoever speaks second, I want you also to tell your uh, elbow partner which one doesn't belong and why. And if you're in an odd group, uh, just form a quick little three. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about which one you excluded and why. Okay? Uh, what, what, and what do you mean by an angle? 
since I'm not a math teacher. Uh, uh -huh. Everywhere the two lines meet. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so let's get to the bottom uh, left. Did anyone choose this one as the odd one out? Just two folks? All right, let's hear what? Option single? Being greater than 180. Okay. Uh, Being greater than 90. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't catch it. Um, okay, so this uh, this is the obtuse angle right here. Okay. All right, and now the last one. Please raise your hand if the bottom left uh, shape is the one you decided to exclude. Um, sure. Tell us why. Just because it's the only one that was shaded. Okay, only one that was shaded. Did anyone choose to exclude this bottom shape? For a reason other than uh, the fact that it was shaded in. It's the fact that it's the only one with the right angle in it. The only one with the right angle in it. Okay. Well, so this is great. I mean, even with, with just this sort of rudimentary set of shapes, everyone in this room was able to to engage and come up with different ideas and different solutions uh, in this task right here, which is excellent. This is what we want to do. This is what we want our students to experience uh, the first time around in problem-based learning. As I'm sure every single teacher in this room knows, and probably the administrators as well, uh, understand that problem-based learning in mathematics can be the most difficult move uh, that a teacher and a student can make. The shift from a uh, highly prescriptive math class to a perhaps overly non-prescriptive math class can sometimes be uh, among the most difficult for students and teachers alike. And what I hope to have you guys experience during this session are some tasks and some design principles that will help set you and your students off on the right foot. None of these tasks that we see are going to be a guarantee. None of the design principles we see are going to be a guarantee. But I hope that, um, that the tasks themselves will point to some uh, attributes of potential ways to start out in problem-based learning and mathematics in an inquiry environment. Um, so the, these are sort of our objectives for today. We're going to be doing some exploring of mathematical tasks, potentially introductory mathematical tasks, or ones to just sprinkle in from time to time. And then we're going to develop some design principles around PRBL implementation, early PRBL implementation, to make sure that it's as successful uh, as and before you ask, uh, I, this slide deck will be available, is available, in the NTN math group. Uh, I strategically put it in the NTN math group if you want to access it, so you'll have to join the NTN math group and uh, check it out in the collections there. So that was very devious of me. So, uh, but I don't think, I, I don't believe we'll need our computers, but you're welcome to follow along in the slide deck there if you, if you want. So this is the part where, you know, there's like a disclaimer. It's like the views contained herein don't necessarily represent the views of such and such organization at large. I want to make that sort of disclaimer here that the views expressed by, um, by, by me may or may not represent the views of the um, organization of NTN at large. Um, I think this is the model that a lot of us work under when we come into a new tech. We go, we are told to go from this to this in the span of one summer. So in 2000, I don't remember, 2004 maybe, I was this, and then in uh, fall of 2005, so May of 2004, and then like August of 2005, this was the expectation. As if it was a binary. But it's not, we all know that. It's more like from this to this. Put those both up there again. So it's, it's more of a spectrum. I know that even when I was ostensibly doing inquiry by doing project-based learning in my math class, I know that it was still a lot of direct teach or it was just really poorly structured inquiry. So there's a chance there might be a third axis here that I'm not even representing. What we want to do is get as close to here as, as possible. We know that we probably won't ever get to that binary. We'll probably never get to this, but that is our, that is our goal at some point. 
another way of looking at it, this, is, this was my uh, calendar in May of 2004. And this was my expected calendar in August of uh, 2004. With, of course, uh, benchmarks and state testing uh, gobbling up about uh, 30 or 40 percent of that time. I don't know if, if that's terribly reasonable. This is a quote from uh, Steve Leinwand, um, and folks that I was talking to earlier in an earlier session have already heard me quote him before. Um, this is what he suggested in an article of his, which I think flies in the face of uh, some of NTN's uh, operating theory of action. For those who don't know Steve Leinwand, he's a, I describe him as a sort of John the Baptist of Common Core. He's kind of crazy. Um, he may or may not eat bugs in the desert, but I think he is really sharp and really smart. Um, and I think, I think he, there, there's something here that, uh, that is potentially disconnecting for a teacher coming into our network. To give you an idea of what a 10% change is per year, uh, I made this handy dandy little chart for you uh, for a teacher starting off at 0 0.5. I have no idea what the y-axis represents, but halfway between 0 and 1, that's at starting at 0 0.5 and uh, getting 10% closer to 1 every year. That's what that looks like. So I, I hope this kind of is um, affirming in a way, even though it can be incredibly challenging when you're in an environment that suggests you should be at one um, from day one. Here's another Steve Leinwand quote I wanted to share, <laughs> which also I hope is affirming. I'm sure everyone in this room has felt inadequate at one point, especially when it comes to math. And I guarantee you, your students have felt like this at some point. And that's why we're going to look at some tasks and explore some design principles about um, starting strong. Now, there's sort of three um, ingredients into a successful math class. And we're going to sort of focus on the tasks at, uh, the tasks uh, place. However, the tasks that we experience today, I hope, speak to some of the other two, particularly the top one. I think the idea of social and emotional safety in a math class is something that I know I, as a high school facilitator, paid much less attention to than I probably should have. What we want to do is create a safe space for students. And a lot of the tasks that students are often given do just the opposite. They're punitive. If a student gets something wrong, then it is wrong. And if they turn it in late, then they're deducted a letter grade. Uh, what we want to do is create a safe space in the mathematical classroom for mathematical ideas. We did that very briefly just a moment ago with our very easy to understand, clear text about deciding which one didn't belong. And it's one that everyone in the classroom, including the uh, non-math teachers, had access to, which is good. So we'll start with a couple tasks that produce uh, social and emo that hopefully produce some so social and emotional safety. Um, so we started with this one right here, and we're going to continue on this route a little bit with the idea of which one doesn't belong. So take a look at these numbers, and again in your head, and then we'll have a chance to share. Pick which one of these four doesn't belong. Which one would you pull out? Just a minute. Okay. All right. Turn to your neighbor and describe uh, which one you decided to exclude and why.
go a little bit further, uh, but I gotta rein it at some point, so that's what we're gonna do right here. Uh, I, but I, I'm gonna ask the question a little bit differently this time, uh, see if you can pick it out. Um, we'll start with um, the bottom left, bottom right number. Um, can someone, can raise your hand if your partner, if your partner decided to exclude the bottom right number? Uh, the, this one. Uh, our, oh, sorry. Okay, now I see the problem. <laughs> and, uh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Sorry, the bottom left number. Did anyone's partner exclude this number? Uh, is, uh, are, is someone about to get sold out? <laughs> so, sold down the river? Well, she had quite a few reasons. Okay, pick, pick your favorite. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember why I'm 25. I don't remember why. Okay. Sure, please do. It was weird thinking, but 9 is 3 squared is 16, it is 4 squared. Decide to exclude the top left. <laughs> Did anyone's party decide to exclude the top left and, and why? Yes, please. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Top, top left. Go for it. He excluded it because all the other ones, their digits added up to seven. Oh. Did I, was everyone able to hear and understand that? Um, those are two very interesting uh, <laughs> and really cool ways to explore these di these four different numbers. I mean, I'm curious. I'll just sort of open it up generally. Was did anyone help? Did anyone else or their partner have a really interesting or novel reason to exclude any of these four numbers that they were just they're just dying to share? Yeah. Forty three is the only prime number. What does prime mean again? The only two numbers go into it evenly. Right, good, good, good. Nine single digit, great. Right? And sixteen is the only even number? A lot of ways to come to these. <laughs> the computer agrees with you. <laughs> nice, okay, great. All right, next, uh, uh, so. So we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna explore uh, some ways to potentially start on problem-based learning that is uh, non-threatening and discourse-producing. Um, the the one, the first and most accurate example of uh, when, when people ask me what should I be looking for in a mathematics classroom, um, I go right, I sort of bypass PBL, I bypass problem-based learning, and I say just listen to what kids are saying. If they're sharing their ideas in the way that you were just sharing them a moment ago. Then I'm then then they're probably in really really good shape. So one uh, one possible task uh, to explore is which one doesn't belong, uh, and I already have already listed them sort of by the back wall. Um, so feel free to explore those. Um, if you're looking for well, I'll show you where to get more of those in a minute. But lest you think that we can only do this with shapes and numbers and. Um, allegedly elementary um, content standards. Let's take a look at this. Again, in, in your head, now, now that we've had some, some, uh, some reps with this, um, take a minute to just take a look and decide which one of these, which one of these four things you'd like to exclude. And then think of a reason why. Um, in the interest of time, I think instead of having you actually discourse with your elbow partner, um, I'm gonna actually just ask you to share it out Class. So let's take 10, 15 seconds to pick one that doesn't belong. There you go. I want to make sure that everyone's had a chance to get some mathematical ideas in their head before we start shouting things out. Does, that, does everyone, everyone have one excluded? Okay, yeah, fire away. Nice one out. Bottom left. It's the only one that's only in the first quadrant. Uh, what does first quadrant mean? It means the upper right. Okay, so this is the only one that is in this 
quadrant, okay? Um, can someone give me a reason to exclude a different one? Feel free to just, uh, yeah, raise your hand. The top right hand, um, it's discontinuous, it's dots, not a continuous. Okay, great. Oh, now how do you know it has a negative slope? Because it's the same slope as the top of the left and the bottom of the left. As the x values get higher, the y values get lower. Excellent. Was anyone, did anyone decide to exclude this one right here? The only one that didn't have this is it broke and It's squiggly. Those are the two sides of the same coin. <laughs> Yeah, so this one sort of flattens out, so it it has a, well, we'll get into derivatives and things like that, but if you're in a calculus class, there's no reason why you couldn't. Okay, uh, so that is what, uh, that is which one doesn't belong. You can sort of do this with anything. I, I should have thought of it. So I, it, I've actually put people's faces up there before. That's kind of fun. Um, but I, I didn't this time. I really wish I had. Just note to self. Um, okay, so next we're going to move on to uh, another t type of task, um, and that is, I want you guys to take a look at this picture and tell me, uh, tell me how long the song "We Will Rock You" by Queen is. Uh, someone, uh, let's see, just, uh, let's have people uh, again, sort of. Sure, I, I do want to collect some of these guesses. Someone that's uh, bold and brave, tell me your best guess for how long We Will Rock You is. Fire away. Two minutes, 33 seconds. Two minutes, 33 seconds. Two minutes, six seconds. Two minutes, six seconds. Two minutes and two seconds. Two minutes and two seconds. One minute and four seconds. One dollar. Highest without going over. One thirty. One forty-five. Let's get maybe two minutes and two seconds. We already have that, so we'll put a little uh, plus one there, I guess. Three minutes and sixteen seconds. Three minutes and sixteen. Okay. All right. There's some good guesses. There's some good guesses. Uh, let's um. Uh, let, let's sort of explore this idea a little bit more. Uh, can someone give me an answer that they know is too high? Four minutes. Hold on, hold on. So we're going to say four minutes. How do you know that's too high? Or what makes you think that it's too high? I'm sorry? Well, the fact that that's 21 seconds up there, and it looks like they might be split it, just split it into different parts, it might be made the five. Oh, okay, so you, oh, okay, so you uh, so I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong. You sort of took this little visual piece right here and added about, you know, four or five. And so you know that by multiplying 21 by four or five, you'll get uh, more or less than four minutes, okay? Most pop songs are less than, on average, like three minutes. Okay, so you're using your sort of uh, induction skills in terms of knowing how, how long pop songs are. Okay. So, uh, so another guess for an answer that's, that's too high, Can, is someone, will, someone willing to guess a number that's too high that is lower than four minutes, knowing that if it goes over and you guess too high, you're out. <laughs> 3.30. 3.30? Okay, are you sure? No, I'm not. Oh, oh well, then, then, well then we don't want that. We, we want to be sure that we are, uh, we are definitely too high. I will not that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it goes more than 3:30, there's gonna yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. What about an answer? What about an answer that's uh, that's too low? Tell me an answer that's that's too low. You know that, that it has to be uh, more than uh, than something. Oh, one second. <laughs> Wait. Hold on one second. Over here. I, I heard. I heard a guess. 21 seconds. Okay. We know that it's uh, probably more than 21 seconds. How do we know that? Because there's still more songs. Okay, so there's a non-zero amount left. Okay, great. Uh, anything, anything under two minutes. So you're saying that one minute and 59 seconds is too low. How do you know? Okay. And 
And if it's uh, if it's uh, more than uh, if it's if it's one fifty nine or less, you remember the rules, right? Okay. Well, let's see. Okay. Here we go. Want to change our guess, or do we want to? <laughs> we good? Do we want to change our, our our too low estimate? We said 159. <laughs> Last chance. <laughs> wow, you are lucky. What a great estimator. Um, unfortunately, uh, none of you got the answer right. So we'll uh, move on to our next design principle. Um, is to include daily estimation, or estimation a lot. I'd say daily knowing that that's probably not a practical reality. So, um, so to include some number sense via uh, estimation. Um, I mentioned which one doesn't belong before. There's a nice library of these uh, online. You can find estimation tests. I skipped over one. You may have seen it with uh, red vines or something like that. Um, but Estimation 180 is a great uh, resource for a myriad of tasks um, such as these. Um, where we ask students to give estimates and give an answer that's too, lie, too high and give an answer that's too low. And again, what we're trying to do here is produce discourse and social and emotional safety in the class. So hopefully by making estimations and being willing to share ideas such as which one doesn't belong or uh, estimating different uh, answers to different scenarios, hopefully what we've done is pave the way for students to feel a sense of uh, social and emotional safety in the classroom and having their mathematical ideas valued, uh, possibly in a way that they haven't been in the past. Okay. Now what we're going to do is look at uh, some tasks that are slightly longer. I really like uh, estimation 180 and which one doesn't belong because they're quick, they don't take longer than 10 minutes in a lot of cases, um, they're fun, and they allow everyone access to the content or just mathematical ideas in general. Uh, now we're going to look at some tasks that may take a little, a little longer of class time, and which are going to speak to some more design principles. All right, could I, um, could I, can you send one of your group members up to the front uh, to get some supplies really quick? Could just send one person or have one volunteer come up to get some, some supplies? taken from uh, Joe Bowler's website, ucubed.org. And the tasks are up here, and um, I'm not going to read you the instructions. We're going to spend about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but one thing that I really want you guys to do and to challenge your, your level partner is each time you successfully complete one of these four, uh, one, two, three, four small tasks, I want to make sure that you that you stop and tell your neighbor and catch your neighbor up if they feel like if you feel like they're struggling. So this uh, this task you're basically asked to fold with different areas, being the outcome, uh, in different ways. So we'll take about 15 minutes for that uh, to, to see if you see if you can complete two, maybe three, or if you're if you're just 
grooving right along. Uh, feel free to try to construct all over. But again, don't leave your elbow partner behind. Okay? And if you need more, you can come up uh, to my class and get some
Once again, I know I'm cutting you guys off a little bit short. Uh, I, I know that uh, like we could do this for a long time, and I, I, I'm excited, and we can try to keep going with this uh, after the session. Um, but I do, I, I would like to see um, if anyone in the, in the class is able to get to the fourth one, is anyone brave enough to uh, explain it to the class, how they got this? All right, nice and loud, let's make sure that we honor our classmates' uh, voice. How did you get to a square with exactly half the area of the original square? Um, to give me some help with exactly where the middle was, I did it how most people probably folded their first triangle one, so I folded it the diagonal of this, like, like a triangle, and then and then we'll sort of talk about this a little bit. Um, another potential design principle is, uh, is the idea of using manipulatives. And what I like about manipulatives isn't necessarily just that it's tactile. It's nice that it's tactile. But one thing that manipulatives uh, offer you the chance to do is lower the bar, lower the consequence of being wrong. Because you can immediately undo what you did. You can get it on the paper, you can unfold it, um, in the same way that we're trying to lower the bar of being wrong via estimation, uh, one, via estimation 180, you can also do that with, with manipulatives. Go to the next task and then we'll get going here. It would be nice if we actually did some PRBL, what did you say? Um, we've done a lot of sort of activities um, which are which are great and and I think they're fun and they're great, but it would be nice to see like a potential um, Now that once we've done these things once we've lowered the bar of entry and lowered the consequence of being wrong and develop some of that social and emotional safety um, We can really start getting into some really cool stuff. Okay? Okay, this is uh, This is what's called a three-act task if you've uh, followed uh, Dan Meyer, you know of his stuff, probably. Um, he presents his task, or he's he designed sort of a format of a task that is sort of a narrative style. So that is in act one of a movie, you sort of set up the conflict. Act two of the movie, you, the hero explores that conflict a little bit. And then in act three, there's some sort of resolution. It, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like our NTN standard problem-based learning lesson, which is again kind of affirming that NCDM endorses it so heartily. So this is our entry event or Act One of our Bucky the Badger task. Um, so all I, all I want you to do is to listen and enjoy. You will need to be able to see the screen, so you, you have to like move a little bit. Uh, you can. Hopefully, it'll be nice and loud. But I will need you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you. Um, well, I want to ask you about it um, after the video, okay? Is everyone in a place where they can see and hear? Okay. Since it turns out we like reporting on cheating in sports, here's today's Is It Cheating News. When the University of Wisconsin football team scores, the team of all fans are very happy. The mascot for the team, Bucky the Badger, I'm sure is also happy. But that happiness is tempered because every time new points go up on the Wisconsin scoreboard, Bucky Badger, the mascot, has to do push-ups for every point that Wisconsin has put on the board. So Wisconsin scores a touchdown and an extra point, Bucky does seven push-ups. Then they score a field goal, the Wisconsin score goes from seven to ten, and Bucky does ten push-ups. Ten more push-ups, I should say. If Wisconsin then scores another touchdown, an extra point, and their score goes to 17, Bucky then does 17 more push-ups, putting his total push-up tally by that point of the game up to 34. Here's the problem, which has given rise to the mystery. On Saturday, the Wisconsin football team scored 83 points. Wisconsin, <laughs> 20. Wisconsin scored 83 points. Hey, shout it out. What's the first question that popped into your head? How many push-ups did he do? I promise you almost everyone in this room was thinking the exact same thing. That's when you know you initiated curiosity. If I've got everyone wondering the exact same thing. So, that's our entry event. Uh, and let's do some uh, analysis. Let's, let's go back to our estimation practices. 
and let's take some estimates. So, first of all, let's get uh, let's get five or six guesses up on the board here. Uh, how many push-ups did uh, do we think Bucky the Badger uh, did? Give me a shout out again. Three hundred. Can you clarify something? I'm not sure I understood. Can okay. Can we ask questions? Um, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so they scored a touchdown, he did seven push-ups. They scored another touchdown, he does 14 Since it turns out, okay. If Wisconsin, their score goes to 17. Oh, ah. Okay, 11. Ah. Since it turns out, we like reporting on cheating. If Wisconsin nope. then scores another touchdown. Okay, okay. I'll stop it here. So it means that he has done seven the first time, 17 the second time. So in other words, what you're asking is the total of this. I am asking for the number of total. When you get down to 83 points on this column, or, or I guess for, yeah. for this column, yeah. Yeah. how many total push ups will he, will he have done, I should say? I think she's confused about this. Does he do just the number of points scored in the last score? No, no, no. Just the total number. He does seven push ups and a field goal. He does 10 push ups, then he does. Another touchdown, he does 17 push-ups. So it's not a score, it's whatever's on the score for that time. Yeah. Can you clarify? I, I'm a cheer mom, and they okay. have to do their push-ups. So. Okay. And we did a lot more push-ups this year. Okay, good. Uh, good. Yeah, good job. it's whatever the score is on the scoreboard. So the first time they scored a touchdown, they got to do seven. But when they scored the next touchdown, the score on the scoreboard was 14. And they had done 14, so they had done seven, then they did 14. So they had done 21 in all. Okay. Are we clear? Did we got it? Yeah, it's that last couple that's weird. I think what you said is what you said. Okay, so uh, we have one estimate of 300. Let's get another couple estimates on the board. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Um, let's take a couple minutes at your tables. I want, I want each table to come up with a consensus estimate, and then I'm going to ask each table, and then we'll uh, eventually, after some more mathematical work, we'll see who's the closest. Okay? All right, come up with a consensus at your table. Information coming up. Okay, you guys ready? Eleven touchdowns, two field goals. Eleven touchdowns, two field goals. That
I want to go, go to every table and get an estimate and a too high and a too low from each table. So let's, uh, let's start with the table in the back. Give me your best estimate of what, uh, of how many push-ups Bucky the Badger did total. You said 625. 625. Okay. Give me an answer that's too high. You know it's too high. A thousand. Number that's too high. Yeah, the table. I'm talking about this table right here. 626. Oh, you sound pretty confident. Uh, you sound pretty confident of 6. Can you explain your reasoning behind that? We tried giving information that they scored 11 touchdowns and two field goals. We kind of calculated the maximum based on if they kicked the field goals at the end. The last piece they scored, they would have the, most, the maximum amount of push-ups. So 625 is the maximum answer. We didn't get a chance to play around with that. Well, they give me an answer this too low. It sounds like what's the thing that's uh, causing po some possible tension is where those field goals occur. Uh, occur. Yeah. So we're still in Act Two here. We're still solving the. Uh, we're still wading our way through the problem. Um, I can tell you that the field goal. There was a field goal in the first quarter after the first touchdown, and then let's see, touchdown, 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 touchdown field goal. Followed by touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. Okay. Take another couple minutes and see if you can tell me how many push ups Bucky the Badger did in total. So here it is. Here it is. Wait, so
sounds like we've all got an answer. Shout it on the count of three. One, two, three. Wow, impressive. All of us came with the exact same answer to this relatively sophisticated task. So let's see, I, I fingers crossed, I hope we're right. With Bucky having to do push-ups equal to the number of points on the Wisconsin scoreboard every time there was a new score, that turns out to be a total of 573 push-ups in a plushy suit with a giant fur head on. <laughs> After Wisconsin scored a 76th point, here's what happened. Bucky Badger left the stadium. <laughs> So the, the last the last task task that we went to, um, the hazard a guess. Um, again, I found that on Dan Meyer's website. He has a list of three act tasks, and you can find lots of teachers and teacher blogs that have similar tasks. Hazard a guess on what grade level that um, that that Bucky the Badger task was allegedly aligned to. Take a guess. Okay, any other guesses? Yes, the Bucky the Badger task, according to the standard that was mapped on it. Three. 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 Uh, according to, according to you know, Dan Meyer's intuition, he suggested that was a third grade uh, content level. Yet, boy was it fun and interesting. And, and I would have no problem giving a, giving a task that is third grade aligned to a high school classroom or a classroom of college-educated uh, adults. <laughs> so, yeah. So, starting strong in problem-based learning. As, as I suggested at the beginning, it may not be reasonable or necessary to go from zero to one, or zero to 100%, I should say, uh, in any working. Maybe it starts like this. Maybe it starts the week one, first week back of school, or the first month, maybe you follow a calendar like this. And um, on Tuesday, you do an estimation 180 task. 
and on Thursday you find a what, uh, which one doesn't belong task. And you take 15, 20 minutes or so. Then November, you're on a little more. Maybe you use a paper folding activity at the beginning of the class. Maybe you use manipulatives on Monday. Then perhaps in January, you can spend part of the class day doing inquiry tasks and teaching uh, you know, from the, the, the textbook or using the tools that you've always had um, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday, you find some, some really deep, complex tasks uh, to go to that kids can spend a, a good, a, a long time swimming in that act two. And then who knows, maybe by the end of the year, we can get here or close to here. And then uh, maybe even by May, this is what your month might be able to look like. With, of course, standardized state testing and benchmarking uh, all over the place still getting in the way because that's not going to go away uh, anytime soon. Um, I was really trying, uh, man, I, was in here earlier. I was really trying to go on a uh, don't quote Jim May challenge. I, was, I actually, I, I threw it out to the coaching staff and we really tried to do a don't quote Jim May challenge, but gosh darn it, um, this is what he said uh, when he first came aboard. I, you know, had lots of questions about how do we change practice and how do we how do we push teachers and students into an inquiry environment when it goes against sort of everything they've experienced up until this point. And this was his advice uh, to me to give to others. And I actually don't know that I've heard him say this. I don't know if he knows that this is something he said to me, uh, but I, I thought that really resonated. Um, that really resonated. So a couple places to, to, to go, a couple next steps potentially. Um, on my blog, if you search for problem-based starter kit, there's um, some sample activities. Again, don't, please don't get hung up on the content about what grade level it is. Um, curiosity is going to be more important than content when you're starting out and trying to build those reps around creating discourse and social emotional safety for students. So that's, that's one place to potentially go. Then another is ucube.org's Joe Bowler's Week of Inspirational Math. It's based on that um, on the hour of coding that you may you may have heard, where it's, it's sort of a, an activity that schools across the country participate in, where they drop everything and code for an hour. Um, that's been really successful. Uh, Joe Bowler has a, a week of activities that are intended to do this. Um, the paper folding activity that we did is an example of one of those activities or one of those types of activities. So those might be two potential next steps, next places to go. Um, this is a lie. Um, Barry uh, just suggested that, uh, just told me that this is actually not true. It's, it, it, it's true, but it's not shown yet. I'll show it within the next um, 30 seconds after finishing off here. Um, as always, you can always find me on Twitter. You can find me on my blog. Um, and I'll make sure that this is uploaded into the NTN math group. So make sure you join that and check it out and join in the discussion there. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me this afternoon.